Welcome to Thursday's edition of Renew Plus. I'm Pastor Tony. Thank you for joining us again today. And we're in our 12th week of the series, The New and Living Way. We're so, we are looking at what the New Covenant tells and reveals to us as believers of the way we should be living. And of course, it is a living way. Whereas the Old Covenant of Law is a, an old and dying way, the New Covenant is a new and living way. But, of course, we have to renew our minds and renovate our belief systems to line up with New Covenant realities, the finished work of God in Christ. Now, let's look back over to 2 Corinthians chapter 3 again today. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to pick up where we left off yesterday from verse number 7. Didn't quite get done with that one. And again, Paul is using this as a contrast comparison between the Old Covenant of Law and the new covenant of grace in the finished work of Jesus. Now, verse number 7, it says, For if the ministry of death, now what is he referring to? He is talking about the old covenant of law. He said, But if the ministry of death, written and engraved on stone, specifically, he's talking about here, the Ten Commandments. Those are what Moses received twice on the mountain. First said he broke, and then he had to go back up there and get them again. But they were written and engraved on stones, the Ten Commandments. Now again, there's nothing wrong with the law, nothing wrong with the Ten Commandments, still the right thing to do, but listen, we're not under it in order to try to keep it, keep the Ten Commandments in order to produce our own righteousness with God. No, God gave us a right standing with God that is perfect and complete in the finished work of God, uh, uh, the finished work in Jesus, in His death, burial, and resurrection, in His redemption. So He's given to us by grace what you can never attain to by trying to keep the Ten Commandments. But what he did was take the Ten Commandments written and engraved on stones and write them in our hearts in the new birth. So by nature, we have the divine nature. We are partakers of the divine nature, as Second uh, Peter says. But now by nature, we're doing the things in the new birth that we should that they were trying to do under the old covenant but could not because they were not born again. They still had the nature of Satan on the inside of them, that rebellious nature. So it says, written and engraved on stones, notice that it was glorious. So there was even a certain amount of glory that was attached to the old covenant of law. Even though we couldn't keep it, even though men could not produce righteousness with God, there was, there was still a certain amount of glory attached to it because it came from God. Now, now notice... If the ministry of death written and engraved on stones was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away. Now that's what I described a couple of days ago. We were describing how Moses went up on the mountain. He said, show me your glory. God said, you can't see the fullness of my glory in, you know, face to face, but this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to cause all my goodness to pass before you. That is what the, good, the glory of God is, is the manifested presence and the manifested all goodness of God. And he said, but I'm going to hide you. I'm going to put you here beside me on the rock. You're going to stand here. As I go by, pass by you, I'm going to put my hand over your face so you can't see my face because you can't live if you do. And you're going to see my back parts. Well, just seeing God passing by, and just seeing the back parts of the glory of God, which is all that the law allowed, that kind of revelation of God, not the full revelation of God and His goodness, but just the backside of the, of the goodness of God. It changed Moses. It changed him. In other words, we see the same reflection. It, shows, it says right here that the children of Israel, he came off of that mountain and he was glowing. I mean, I, you know, we're not talking about nuclear stuff. We're talking about the presence of God. We're not talking about radiation. We're, we're talking about the glory of God. He came off of that mountain. It changed his countenance. But because he did not have the kind of righteousness that we have available under the new covenant because of the finished work of Jesus, that glory faded out. That glory faded out. So verse number 8 says, how would the ministry of the Spirit... Now, what is he referring to? He's talking about the new covenant that we live under today. He said, how would the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? Not be more glorious. 
So even, you know, what they had under the old was glorious, but it was not anything in comparison to the kind of glory that we can expect in this new covenant. Remember we read over in Romans chapter 5 verse 2 a couple of days ago that now because we're just about, justified by faith, we're no longer coming short of the glory of God. we now been justified, been declared righteous by the finished work of Jesus through faith. And now we are to rejoice in hope, in expectation of the glory of God. We're to be rejoicing now in expectation of that glory. And see, that's what he's talking about. How would the ministry of the Spirit, this new covenant that we're in in Christ, not be more glorious? Verse 9, For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. So notice, again, he, he refers to the old covenant of law as the ministry of death and the ministry of condemnation. And it had a certain measure of the glory of God. In other words, we had a certain revelation of God's goodness. But the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. And you say, well, what does this have to do with me? Well, it has everything to do with you. Because the glory of God, the manifested presence and the goodness of God are what's going to take you out of just the natural realm into the supernatural realm. It's going to take you out from under the demands, the weighted, crushing demands of the law and take you over into the area of supply. Now, what I'm talking about with supply, the supply of grace, the glory of God is the manifested supply of God's grace in Christ. And what does it do? It will meet every need in, that we'll ever have in life, spirit, soul, body. It will be here yesterday, today, and tomorrow in our future. We don't have to worry about our future because the same grace and glory that was available yesterday, that was available way before then for the Apostle Paul, Peter, all those other ones of the early church is the same grace and glory that's available to you and I as believers under this new covenant. You know, we often quote Philippians chapter 4, verse 19 but now that we know these things right here, see, revelation begots revelation. But now we can quote it with a different, uh, a new sense of reality in our life. Philippians 4.19 says, And my God shall supply, notice the word supply there, shall supply all your need. In other words, any and every need. Now it's written in the context of financial need there. Now financial needs present one type of need in our life. But man, we have all kinds of needs because we're not just one dimensional. We're not just material, physical beings. We're spirits. We're, we have a soul. We live in a physical body. We have material needs and wants and desires here in this life. We, we have a need of purpose. We have a need of a greater purpose and plan for our life than just what we can conjure up. But it says there, and my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. According to his riches in his all goodness that's available for us in full measure in the finished work of Jesus in Christ in this new covenant. So in other words, there's not going to be a need in your life that is not met out of his riches and glory. There's not going to be a problem in your life they, there's not a solution according to God's riches and glory in Christ Jesus. There's not going to be a challenge in our life. Now, those challenges, of course, can stump us pretty quick. They can get over your head and above your pay grade real quick. But they're not ever going to get above God's pay grade, okay? They're never going to be above the Most High. If He's the Most High, there's not going to be anything above Him. So in, no matter what challenge or situation that we face in life, there's, not, there's never going to be a situation where you're going to go to God and, and present that, that challenge and he's going to turn around and say, well, I don't know. I don't have anything for that. I don't have any solution for that. I'm stumped. <laughs> you're never going to go see God throw up his hands and say, that is too big for me. Never. And you know what? There's always going to be something out of the riches of God's glory, his manifested presence of goodness in our life, 
to meet every need, to solve every problem, and to face and overcome any challenge in our life. Again, you know, we, we quoted a couple of uh, weeks ago out of 2 Corinthians 12, 9, where Paul was facing a challenge. You know, it doesn't mean that we're never going to face challenges and problems, I can tell you. But in the middle of those challenges and problems, we have to know and be confident and aware of and in expectation of, to the point of rejoicing in the middle of that situation, we need to be rejoicing in confident expectation of God's goodness in our life. You know, Paul, he ran across some things and he was stumped. He said, I besought the Lord three times, it would depart from me. And then the Lord said, or said to him, my grace is sufficient for you. That's not a no answer. What he's telling Paul right there, he's given him a revelation that there's nothing that you're going to face in life that there's not sufficient supply according to God's grace. There's not ever going to be a problem, a situation, a challenge, uh, whatever, that you're going to face in life that the grace of God is not sufficient. Yeah, you may be insufficient in and of yourself, but our sufficiency isn't in and of ourself. Our sufficiency is in and of God through Jesus. That's why we can trust in Him. That's why we can trust in His grace. That's why we can trust and know that there is a supply of grace in God's riches of glory that will meet every need and help us overcome every problem. So that was, a, that was an answer, a positive answer to Paul's problem. Paul was stumped. He said, I'm facing this everywhere I go. But God turned around and said, there's a sufficient grace to meet every need. Now, you know, we quoted this one before also, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. God said, therefore come boldly, confidently, to the throne of grace. That means supply, the throne of supply, in order to f obtain mercy and to find grace to help in a time of need. Now, I know a lot of people, they would say, well, that's just for the sweet by and by when we all get to heaven. Well, there's two words in that verse that indicate is for right now, time and need. You're not going to get to heaven and have either one of those. It's eternity, no time there. And there's not going to be needs in heaven, just supply. But God wants you to know that you can come right now, in the rotten here and now, in your time of need, you can come and find a grace supply in order to help you in that time of need. And see, that glory is the manifested goodness and the manifested supply of God in His presence. It comes directly from God, and it's for us. So it says in verse number 10, For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect, because of the glory that, ex that excels. So in comparison to the glory of the old, to the glory of the new, is again, like I said yesterday, gave that illustration, it's like a candle in a dark room, it looks pretty bright, but you get it out in the full noonday sun, it's nothing. And that's what God is saying right here, what we had under the old covenant was basically a candle. But what we have under the new covenant is a full noonday sun brightness. And so verse 11 says, For if what was passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. In other words, the old covenant of law passed away. God replaced it with a new and better covenant we've been talking about over these last 11 and a half weeks. And he says it is much more glorious. The supply, the things that we have under the Re reality of the new covenant far exceed the types and the shadows of the old covenant. Verse 12, therefore, since we have such hope, since we have such confident expectation of God's goodness and, pre and his manifested presence in our life, his supply, we use great boldness of speech. Unlike Moses, verse 13, who put a veil over his face, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. That glory that changed his countenance, that caused him to brighten up, it was fading out. That was the problem. And he put a veil over his face because they didn't want to see it, first of all. And second of all, he didn't want them to see it was fading out. Okay? But no notice in verse number uh, 
I got to skip on down just for the sake of time here. We only have a couple of minutes. Verse 16 of that same chapter, it says, Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, to Jesus, to the new covenant, the grace of God, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Not bondage. Liberty. Freedom. Verse, four, verse 18. But we all, every one of us under the new covenant, with an unveiled face, are beholding, looking, fixing our focus, on, uh, as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord. We're looking as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, seeing a reflection of that in Jesus, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now notice the same thing that, that was fading out under the old is just getting brighter and brighter under the new. Now notice right here, he says that we have changed from glory to glory. Actually, what he's talking about is when we pass from the old covenant of law to the new covenant of grace in the finished work of Jesus, we went from the old inferior uh, small gra uh, glory under the old to the exceeding bright glory under the new. That is the reality for all of us. And what is it doing? Whereas the old co covenant of law demanded but could not change, the new covenant of grace and the glory of God actually changes us and transforms us into the same image that we're looking at in the face of Jesus himself. Boy, this is powerful. I tell you, this is good. I've got to stop right there. I wish we didn't have to stop, but we do. We're out of time. Join us again tomorrow as we pick up from here and finish off the week. If you'd like additional materials, go to TonyCowan.org, and we will see you tomorrow.